Good morning. My name is Sanjana Kurupu and I am the Child Accountability Specialist at the International Rescue Committee. I manage a research and practice initiative on accountability to children and inclusion of adolescent girls with intellectual disabilities. This is a project that started in October of last year and goes on until September 2025, funded by the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance of USAID. In this capacity, I also co-lead the Accountability to Children Advisory Group of the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. I wanted to use this time and space today to share some thoughts on why we need to center accountability to children in humanitarian action. Here, children are defined as those under 18 years of age in line with the CRC. I understand that knowledge, training, and possibly practice on accountability and accountability to children in particular varies across this audience. But interestingly, this variation is not limited to development and humanitarian actors, be it frontline staff or technical experts. This extends to communities and children who are served by humanitarian actors. So how do children define and understand accountability? Do they see this as an integral part of service provision? Do they see themselves as right holders? Does this seem more of a secondary priority that follows life-saving assistance. So do children across responses see their views and opinions as important and impactful? Do they think that their participation can lead to change and course correction? This brings us to the role of accountability in child protection. So prevention, as you know it, is a key tenant of child protection. This entails a comprehensive awareness of the context of operations, explicit and implicit threats to children, drivers of violence across schools, homes and communities. So to this end, engaging with children from the onset, using platforms and media that they are comfortable with, will support firstly, an understanding of the challenges in relation to child protection and abuse, including sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment. This engagement will also maximize and strengthen community-based prevention and response measures. Ensuring awareness and uptake by children of mechanisms in place to mitigate and report concerns and obtain assistance for survival is also key. So this brings us to the question, are there spaces and channels open for children to meaningfully engage in line with their evolving capacities as outlined in the CRC? I then go on to look at safeguarding and do no harm. So safeguarding measures that are put in place can also serve, interestingly and ironically, as a deterrent to child participation. The desk review that we did as part of the project and the groundwork showed us that the lack of specialized expertise, along with funding for the same, is often cited by implementing agencies as a reason for limited engagement with children and in many cases even no engagement at all. So many would rather err on the side of caution than attempt to engage with children because of a fear of making mistakes and causing harm. So this begets the question of how do we ensure that children are protected, particularly those who are vulnerable, whilst also ensuring that they have a seat at the decision-making table. This includes, for example, children on the move, those with disabilities, children associated with armed forces and groups, those who are unaccompanied, etc. So children are the best place to tell us about their circumstances, draw from their lived experiences and explain their needs and preferences. This applies to both overarching interventions at say, central community level as well as those that target children in particular. Then we look at children in most instances as passive hidden beneficiaries. However, this is not the case. Children are important influencers and actors in their own right. They can influence their peers, households, communities and community institutions both directly and indirectly. So humanitarian actors need to adopt a capability lens when working with children, building on their skills, expertise and talents. Child and youth-led community emergency prepared measures on cyclones in Bangladesh proved to be an effective measure in guiding and mobilizing communities in times of crisis. Another example is Papua New Guinea, a country prone to recurrent natural disasters, 
where the National Disaster Management Center specifically outlines the potential and advantage of working with children and youth as part of disaster response. Two other examples include the Nepal earthquake in 2015, where children, using the countrywide network of children's clubs and youth, organized themselves informally to support the national response while working with both government and non-governmental entities. In the Ukraine response in 2022, with the support of UNICEF Romania and local municipalities, Romanian young people volunteered to support their Ukrainian peers who were arriving in Romania as refugees, providing information both on and offline, coordinating meals and health checks, access to safe spaces, etc. Again, in the context of a humanitarian response, it is crucial to understand existing systems at community level. Because research shows that children's first point of contact, if they have a concern, want clarification or want to report an incident, is a sibling or a peer, family member or trusted member of the community. Now, while they may be aware of formal mechanisms and structures which tick all the boxes of safe, accessible, child-friendly, etc., these may not be a first choice for children. Therefore, it is important to map and ask children about community-based mechanisms for AAP and their usage and familiarity with these mechanisms, which will in turn help to minimize replication and maximize uptake. The next point is on collective AAP. So interagency mechanisms and collaborations, for example, the multi-sector needs assessments, which also capture needs, services and impacts on children, through disaggregated data are important because they reduce the burden on communities, including children, on data collection. They enable non-specialist organizations to access information on children and participate in assessments that are led by agencies with specialized expertise on children. It is also a cost-effective option that supports a coherent and evidence-based response. So then we come to the question of What is in it for children? Being accountable to children also means ensuring that attempts at engagement are not tokenistic. So is there an added value to engaging with children? Is it in their best interest, noting the opportunity costs for them, especially in emergency settings? Or is it a matter of better optics for the implementing agency that they covered consultations with so many children across age, gender and disability markers, What is the end vision, end result for children? So how will you use this engagement and how will you report back to children? A reminder on that note that closing the loop applies to children as well. And is their investment proportionate to the results that are planned for children? In conclusion, I want to emphasize that accountability to children is not limited to feedback collection. It means supporting proactive participation in line with their evolving capacities across all points of the humanitarian program cycle, supporting collaborations with engage with them in co-design and implementation. It means communicating with children on how their feedback was used or why it was not used. It also supports evidence-based advocacy with both donors and duty bearers. Thank you. Thank you.